You often hear about how the stock market is doing every day, but are you able to explain exactly what stocks are and how the stock market works? In this video, we will explain the stock market in five levels of difficulty, from child to teenager, college student and grad student, and finally, expert. Stocks represent a small part of a big company. Think about a company as a pizza, cut into slices, and each slice represents a share of the total. When you buy a slice, you own part of that pizza, and when you buy a stock, you own part of that company. There are lots of different companies out there that you can buy stocks in. American Airlines, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, or Apple. Just like there are lots of different pizza flavors, margarita, cheese, pepperoni, mushroom, and Hawaiian. When you own a stock, there are two ways in which you can make money. First, you can make money when your stock goes up in value. Imagine there is only one pepperoni pizza in the world, and you just happen to have bought a slice of it. If pepperoni pizza becomes popular and everyone decides they would also like a slice, then you might be able to sell your slice for a higher price than you originally paid. Second, you can also make money from dividends. This is when a company shares part of its profits with everyone who owns their stocks. It's like earning a bit of income just for owning a slice of pizza. However, when you own a stock, there is a risk you can lose money as well. You can lose money when either the specific company or the entire economy is not doing well. First, there is a risk that a company is not doing well. Imagine pepperoni pizza loses its popularity because people now prefer cheese pizza. This means you might no longer sell your slice for a higher price and may even only be able to sell it for less than you paid for it. This is true for companies as well. For example, American Airlines can struggle if people begin to prefer flying Delta Airlines. This is why diversification is important, meaning that you invest in different companies. Second, there is a risk that the entire economy is not doing well. Imagine people started to prefer eating pasta instead of pizza. In this case, the price for all pizzas will go down regardless of the kind of pizza. This is the same as if the entire economy is impacted by an issue like a war or a pandemic. This is why stocks might go up in price in one year, but go down in price in other years. Imagine you want to start a lemonade stand. You only have $10 yourself, but need $100 to get started. If nine more people decide to give you $10, you now have the money you need. You just completed your initial public offering, or IPO, and each person that invested now owns one-tenth of your business. Fast forward one year and your lemonade stand is doing really well. You made your first profits, which you share with your investors, who get $1 each. You just paid your first dividends. Someone else now wants to own part of your little company as well. They now have to approach one of your initial investors to ask them to sell their stock. One stock that was worth $10 one year ago, they're now willing to pay $20. Your stock price has increased in value. However, this can move in the other direction as well. Sales for your lemonade stand may decrease in your second year perhaps because another lemonade stand opens in your street with lower prices. Or people switch to soda. Or a cool and rainy summer means people are not out as much. The stock market brings companies and investors together. Companies that need money and investors who want to invest their money. Companies get money when they sell their stocks on the stock market through an initial public offering, or IPO. Investors buy these stocks with the expectation that the companies they invest in will increase in value over time and earn them money. After the IPO, stocks are traded directly between individuals as a way of betting on the future success or failure of these companies. Stocks are equal to a share in a company, and large companies can have a massive amount of stocks where each one represents a minuscule percentage of the total company. Take Coca-Cola as an example. The company is one of the most successful brands in history and sells their products in over 200 countries. It's a publicly listed company which had its IPO on the New York Stock Exchange in 1919. Imagine if you had invested $100 during the IPO and still held on to the stocks more than 100 years later. They would now be worth more than $40 million. The Coca-Cola company is divided into 4 billion stocks and one stock trades at $60, 
meaning the total company is valued at $250 billion. This means that if you buy just one stock, you own only 0.0000025% of the company. The stock market brings together millions of individual investors and their decision to buy and sell stocks determines the value of the companies they are trading. But how exactly does a trade happen? People who want to buy a stock offer a bid, which is the highest amount they are willing to pay. People who want to sell a stock offer an ask, which is the lowest amount they are willing to receive. For a trade to happen, buyers and sellers have to meet and agree on a price. Take Coca-Cola as our example again. One stock is currently worth $60. A key concept that most stock exchanges are using is an order book, which records the amount of stocks people want to buy or sell and at which price. Let's assume you want to buy 100 stocks of Coca-Cola and the maximum you want to pay for is $58 for one stock. Your order will now appear in the order book. So far, no one else has placed any order to buy or sell their stocks of Coca-Cola, so yours is the first one in. Now, additional orders from other people come in and there is now someone willing to pay $59. And there is also someone willing to sell their stocks for $61. So far, nothing has been bought or sold yet. If you want to buy the stock, you can wait until someone is lowering their ask, or you can increase your bid by $2 to $60 to move up the order book, or you can decide to increase further to $61 to finally find a trading partner. The stock price has now increased from $60 to $61. Now, let's assume that Coca-Cola just announced they had a bad year with decrease in profits, and the person who previously wanted to sell their 1,000 stocks for at least 65 now desperately wants to get out and is willing to accept even 55. This person will be able to sell 100 stocks at 59, 50 stocks at 57, and 850 stocks at $56. For large companies like Coca-Cola, Trading typically happens every few seconds, and each trade can change the price based on how much investors are willing to pay. In our next level, we will understand how the value of a stock can be determined. There are different models to value a stock. One of them is the Dividend Discount Model, or DDM, which assumes that the stock price is equal to all dividends you can expect to receive in the future. However, we also need to incorporate the time value of money, which states that money you receive today is worth more than the same amount of money in the future. Typically, this is because money you have today can be invested and will grow over time. In reverse, this means that money you expect to receive in the future has to be discounted by the opportunity cost for investors, meaning what you could have earned if the money was invested elsewhere. This formula assumes that the stock price will increase if you expect dividends to increase in the future. For example, if you expect the company to pay more dividends in three years, you discount the extra dividend to today's value, and this is the amount people would be willing to pay more for the stock today. This formula also assumes that the stock price will decrease if the opportunity costs increase. You might still receive $10 of dividends in three years, but these $10 are worth a lot less in today's terms. For example, if you can get a higher interest rate on your savings account, investors are less willing to invest in riskier stocks and will pay less for the stock today because better returns can be had elsewhere. Let's take a look at a specific example. Coca-Cola, for every stock, has been paying stable dividends of almost $2 every year. If you assume the company continues to pay this amount every single year in the future, and if we assume opportunity costs of 4% you could get on your savings account, then we can calculate the stock price of Coca-Cola as ratio between the two, meaning the fair price according to the model would be $50. The dividend discount model is a useful valuation tool for value investors who focus on generating regular cash flows from their investments, instead of growth investors whose main aim are stock price increases in the future. The model works better for established companies, which have been around for years and have a history of regular and stable dividend payments. The model doesn't work well for new companies and startups that don't yet pay dividends and instead reinvest their cash to expand their business. Another limitation of the model is that it's based on estimates, 
it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Going back to our earlier example, who knows if Coca-Cola will be able to continue to pay $2 in dividends for all eternity? The model is also very sensitive, meaning small changes in assumptions can have a large impact on our final result, the stock price. If opportunity costs or interest rates increase from 4 to 5%, the fair stock price, according to the model, would be dropped from $50 to $40. Now you know how to value a stock in theory. In reality, however, there are many other factors that can impact the price of a stock. This is where psychology and people's behavior comes into play. In this section, we will look at two examples where the price of stocks was disconnected from economic reality and why. In the late 1990s, we saw the buildup of a massive bubble for internet stocks. The companies impacted were largely those with a dot-com domain in their name and internet address. The Nasdaq index, which measures the average price of technology stocks, increased exponentially by almost 800% between 1995 until its peak in 2000, only to crash by 80% in the following two years, causing losses to investors of $5 trillion. So, what happened here? This period coincided with an unprecedented growth in internet adaptation around the world. Many internet-based companies were starting up and they needed money, which they got from selling their stocks to investors. There were countless IPOs of dot-com companies that had never generated any revenue or profit. There were three reasons behind these sky-high valuations that were disconnected from all economic reality. One, investors would use traditional valuation models we covered in the previous level and put in massively over-optimistic assumptions about how much money these companies might generate and pay out in the future. Two, investors focused on the completely wrong metrics to value these companies. Instead of focusing on revenue, profit, or dividends, they argued that we were in a paradigm shift, where company value should be assessed based on traffic growth to their company's websites. 3. Investors didn't care about the true value of the companies. Instead, they speculated that there will still be other investors willing to pay more for the stock than what they bought it for. Most startups didn't have viable business models which could generate money. They were highly speculative and overvalued, resulting in a stock price bubble that grew bigger and bigger for years. Valuations became outrageous and share prices continued to grow as demand was overwhelming. The busting of the bubble was inevitable. The question was just when? The collapse started with the beginning of the new millennium. Investors were throwing money at internet companies which were in a race to get big quickly. Many companies used the money not for investments in infrastructure but on marketing in order to build market share as fast as possible. Some startups spent as much as 90% of their budget on advertising, and they offered their products and services for a discount, or even for free, with the expectation that they could build a customer base first and charge profitable rates in the future. When they burned through their money they raised during their IPO without having generated any revenues or profit, many of them started to declare bankruptcy. A few companies that struggled in the fallout but survived to grow into the tech giants we know today some of the most valuable and profitable companies in the world. We are, of course, talking about behemoths such as Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. In January 2021, we saw one of the most extreme short squeezes in stock market history when an army of Reddit investors took on hedge funds to drive the stock price of the struggling US video game retailer GameStop to explode from below $20 to over $500 in the space of a month. What happened here? To understand what happened here, we first need to understand the concept of short selling. Traditional investing in stocks means you buy a stock and hope to sell it later at a higher price. Short selling stocks means you borrow the stock from someone else, sell it immediately and hope to buy it back later at a lower price. The idea is that you then return it to its original owner who will also receive interest or a borrowing fee for lending you the stock in the first place. In traditional investing, when you buy a stock, the most you can lose is your initial investment, if the stock falls to zero. In short selling, your losses can be unlimited, as in theory there is no upper limit to the price of a stock and the amount you might have to pay to replace the borrowed shares. 
A short squeeze happens when there are a lot of people who borrowed shares and they now have to buy these back at the same time. This could be triggered by some positive news about the company, which increases the stock price, which causes losses for the short sellers as they now have to put more money down to buy back the stock. In the case of GameStop, 140% of their stocks had been sold short. How is this even possible? It means that a short seller borrowed the stock from the original owner and sold it in the market. The new owner of the stock lent them out again, just like the previous owner did, not knowing that they were on the other side of a short sale. What followed was one of the most extreme short squeezes in stock market history. A new generation of retail investors, armed with stimulus money from the COVID pandemic and free time from lockdowns, decided to take advantage of the company's low stock price and the high short interest. Over time, they started buying stocks, while Wall Street and large hedge funds were building short positions. In January 2021, the short squeeze started, catapulting the stock price from $17 at the beginning of the month to reach a pre-market peak of over $500 at the end of the month. At that point, the loss for short sellers was colossal, estimated to exceed $20 billion. Other stocks with significant short interest exploded in value at the same time. Stocks in US movie theater chain AMC Entertainment increased from $8 in January to more than $200 in June. Stocks in AMC Networks, which is completely unaffiliated with AMC Entertainment, increased from $36 in January to almost $80 in March. Not because there was high short interest, but just because the name sounded similar. If you enjoyed this video, please like and leave a comment. And if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe to my new channel and turn on notifications.